Okay, to make this wine, we will be using the following. Going to be using six pounds of fresh, unpitted cherries. We're going to be using approximately three pounds of sugar. That might change. Check the final recipe at the end of the video uh, for any changes. We're going to be using a Red Star Premier Classic wine yeast. If you don't have it, use whatever you got. For our tannin substitute, we're going to be using black tea. For our acid blend substitute, we're going to be using the juice of half a lemon. Back up here. To bring our measure up to one gallon or four liters, depending on how you're making it, uh, you need uh, fresh water. You need something to do primary fermentation in. Um, possibly one with a wide mouth opening so you can get your fruit in and out. This particular fermenter does come with its own built-in earlock which is that there. If not, you will most definitely need your own airlock with bung and something to do secondary fermentation in because after about a week in here, it's going to go in here. Uh, you'll need something to determine how much your alcohol level is. So we're looking at uh, having the need for a hydrometer. Draining bags will always, always be helpful, optional. And before you do anything, you want to make sure that all of your equipment and utensils have been sanitized with your sanitizer of choice. And that's what I'm going to be using to make this wine. Now, probably the easiest way of dealing with these cherries is if you've got a cherry pitter to go ahead and pit these, uh, remove the pits from these cherries. But since I don't have one, my option is going to be this way. I'm going to remove all of these little stems. Okay, with that having been done, the next thing we want to do is that we want to give these cherries a good rinse. And then we want to put them in the freezer for 24 hours. And the reason for that is that we want to try and break up the cell wall to help extract some more of the juice so we can move on to the next step. Okay, now that our cherries have come out of the freezer and have thawed out quite sufficiently, the cherries themselves are now quite soft. And one thing about the cherries being soft, I wouldn't say mushy, kind of close to it, but soft is that Whereas before, we couldn't do anything with the pits and the cherries. Now, because they are so soft, we can actually just squeeze out the pits. And put those aside. And move on to the next one. It is a juicy affair, so you quite seriously want to do this over the sink. If you're going to do it this way, if you don't want to do it this way, then you just go ahead and start mashing them up with a potato masher, which I had planned to do anyway. But since this is kind of working, it's a slow process. Yeah. yeah. But um, I'm going to do this instead. I was going to macerate the, the berries, the cherries rather. But since this is working, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and do this. So let me finish this up and uh, move on to the next step. All right, now that that's done, we can proceed to the next step. We're going to take two quarts of our water and we're going to go ahead and get that in the pot and we want to bring that up to a boil. All right. 
Now that our water's come to a boil, let's turn the heat down a little bit. And we can go ahead and add our cherries. Now, if you want to put them in the straining bag first, please feel free. Want to do it afterwards like I'm going to do it? Please feel free. Remember to let that come back up to a center. All right. Now that our juice has come to a simmer, let's turn off the heat. And while we're at it, taking our freshly sanitized potato masher, may as well take an opportunity to help mash up some of these berries a bit more. To extract a bit more of that juice. And now, our, since our mixture is still nice and hot, we're going to go ahead and add four cups of sugar or two pounds of sugar, depending on how you look at it. And let's go ahead and incorporate that. We might make an adjustment later on in the amount of sugar we want to add, depending on our hydrometer reading. We won't be able to determine that until after this is cooled down. So while we're waiting for this to cool down, we may as well start getting our, our tannin substitute mixture in our acid blend mixture together. So we can add that to the pot. Get our can of substitute mixture going. We just need to add one black tea bag. And I'm going to use half a cup of water. No need to be precise. And we want to bring this up to a simmer. Now is a good time as any to go ahead and add our straw black tea slash tannin substitute to the mix. And let's spray till this comes down to room temperature. Now that our cherry juice mixture has come down to room temperature, I'm going to go ahead and transfer that into our fermenter. There are a couple of ways you can do it. You can either just pour it directly into your fermenter. If you've got a wide mouth fermenter, if you've got a narrow mouth fermenter, then you'll be straining out the cherries, of course. I'm going to use a straining bag and strain my cherries that way, but they are going to go into the fermenter. This makes it easier for me to keep it clean or do the cleanup afterwards. So we'll go ahead and start this process. All right, now would also be a good time, as I've done with the other straining bag, is to give these just a little bit of a preliminary squeeze. Before tying them up. So we can get an idea of just how much, roughly how much juice we actually have and whether or not we need to top it off with any additional water to bring us up to our 
one gallon or four liters. And in my particular case, I am about just a little bit shy. So I'm going to add a little bit more water. Bring me up to where I need to be. And the next thing I want to do, since I've got space to do it, I'm going to take a hydrometer reading. All right, looks like we've got a hydrometer reading of 1.104. Now is as good a time as any to go ahead and get our acid blend substitute incorporated. Go ahead and add that to the mix. Okay, with that now done, we can go ahead and return our bag of cherries to the mix. We're not wasting any wine. And following that, we want to put her in our cap. Because what I'm going to do after this is that we now need to convert our juice into wine by adding our yeast. Now again with your yeast, you really don't need a whole package unless you're making five gallons. This is a one gallon batch, so I'm using a quarter of a teaspoon of, of yeast. Kind of sprinkle it around best you can. For those of you who want to hydrate your yeast, please feel free. I've had nothing but success just by sprinkling my yeast around. I don't need to stir it up. I don't need to shake it up. Although, that wouldn't hurt. And what I'm going to do is, once I put the cover back on, uh, for the next three days at least, I'm going to come in with a, with a, with a good wide spoon that I've sanitized, and I'm going to give it a vigorous stir uh, to incorporate some more oxygen, help the yeast out a bit. After three days, I generally don't do it, but they say you can go up to five, but I'm not going to test that theory out. Um, this particular fermenter does have a built-in airlock, which is a little red dot you see. Uh, it does have a regular bubbler style airlock that uh, goes with it, but I don't use that anymore because I already know my stuff is, is fermenting away. So all we need to do now is, uh, is put a label on it. But one other thing about... Uh, what comes next after this, after about, oh, since I'm dealing with fresh fruit, after seven days, I'm going to take the bags out. I'm going to transfer this into our secondary container and start uh, the process of secondary fermentation. Uh, racking every two, six or eight weeks or so until wine gets clear, at which point in time we'll degas it, past, uh, bottle it, pasteurize it, <laughs> and uh, get it ready for uh, for drinking. A good time for this wine is going to be about 12 months. All right, it's time to label our creation. What we have here is fresh cherry wine. We started on 6-4 of this date, and our starting gravity reading was 1.104. All right, so there we go. We'll put that aside. Give it a little bit of love and attention for the next three days. Seven days after we start, we go ahead and rack it secondary. After that, the occasional racks. And after that, the process continues. So if you like to see here, please click on that subscribe button. You see in the lower right-hand corner, it's not there for decorations. It's there for purpose. Make use of it. I appreciate it. Try to get 10,000, hopefully, before the end of the year uh, subscribers. But there we go. That's how I make one gallon batch of fresh cherry wine. Okay, in this video, we're going to be doing a taste testing of a 12-month-old batch of fresh cherry wine that I made. Uh, this is the first time that I've made uh, cherry wine using fresh fruit instead of frozen. Uh, a couple of observations about that later on. But 12 months later, it's now time to do a tasting. And we're going to get right into this one, so we can keep this in under five minutes. Okay, a couple of things. One, I just bottled this like yesterday. 
made a label for it along with the rest of the bottles, but I decided since I'm going to be doing this bottle tomorrow or rather the day after, why put it on knowing full well that I won't have to scrape it off uh, after after it's done? Same thing with not putting in a cork. <laughs> cork, no. So this will be a very quick step one. Fresh cherry wine, born 620-21, uh, ABV of 14.44%. Got up a little, got up kind of high up there. And of course, it's in pasteurized, which is my way of stabilizing my wine since I don't use sulfites. Uh, the wine was clear. I mean, yeah, it's clear. So there was like no sediment after 12 months of sitting in a carboy. I mean, it, a couple of rackings and basically it's going to clear up. So that was all I'm going to say about that. We're going to get right into this one because I'm going to really try to keep this under five minutes. It's been back sweetened, uh, to be sure, uh, which is what I do with most of my wines. I don't really like them dry. Uh, before even test tasting this one, uh, cherry wines, I mean, it's kind of hard not to go wrong with, with, a, cher with a cherry wine. Uh, uh, I've made a couple of batches of frozen cherry wines, and before I even taste this one, I'll just simply say this. Um, the process that I used, uh, yeah, I used fresh cherries. I didn't have a cherry pitter, you know, to pick the cherries out. Uh, and I had uh, like a one-day delay while I was trying to finish up another project, so I put the cherries uh, in the freezer which had the uh, uh, unintended benefit of, uh, once they thaw it out, of being able to simply squeeze out the pits without having to use any other any other uh, 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 artificial means to do so. But uh, having done that, it was kind of like, well, if I bought frozen cherries, they were, they were already pitted, what's the difference? Actually, there was not. So next time I make a batch, it'll probably be with frozen cherries. It's a lot quicker and easier. Uh, that having been said, I'm going to go ahead and give it a quick taste, even though I tasted it yesterday when I actually made it. was pretty good. And let's see what a day has done. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's smooth. It's not harsh at all. Uh, you're not really getting into that, even though it's at 14.44%. Uh, you're not really getting a lot of alcohol uh, at all. I would say the acidity is right. I don't think I'll be making any changes there to the original recipe. Uh, again, having the benefit of these two lights. Uh, yeah, there, it, it, it went very, very clear. I was very happy about that. Uh, I don't remember if I used pectin enzyme. I'm kind of hoping I didn't because I'm still trying to get away from that. Uh, try and keep things as, as natural as possible or more to the point, as grocery store friendly as possible. Um, I did do my last video was at one on uh, the difference between pasteurized and unpasteurized meads. I did one bottle of four, three bottles pasteurized, you know, four bottles pasteurized, one bottle unpasteurized. They had a taste testing of, of the difference between that. And the pasteurization on the meads turns out that the pasteurized ver version was a bit softer uh, the unpasteurized version was a bit crisper in taste, but again, if you're not using sulfites and you need a way of stabilizing the wine unless you're planning on drinking it that day or shortly thereafter, pasteurization still works. The trade-off was my, my pay up. Uh, again, very short video, uh, fresh cherry wine. Uh, I don't have a bottle of the uh, frozen cherry wine to compare it up against, but uh, uh, if what you've got are fresh cherries, and these were dark, sweet cherry, really... Okay. <laughs> if, if what you've got are fresh cherries, give it a try. Uh, I think the next time I try this, I'll be using uh, the, uh, the the real red cherries. It's my son. He's blowing up my phone. He's telling me that they finally found out what what child is going to be, boy or girl. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be a granddad. <laughs> God, I now feel old. <laughs> that being aside... Uh, again, final thoughts. This is good. No other friends and butts about it. Uh, yeah, cherry wines are definitely on my uh, to make again uh, uh, um, our uh, agenda. I think I've got a two gallon batch of uh, cherry wine uh, somewhere in, in the works. Uh, 
Sherry Mead is also a very good one. Uh, give that a try if you haven't. But uh, again, short video. Uh, this is a winner. Definitely will be making this one again. Uh, that being said, click on the subscribe and notify buttons, and I will see you in the next video. Yeah. <laughs>